Tonight on Greater Boston, we kick off our week of debates on the ballot questions you'll decide in November. First up, question one, the so-called fair share amendment or millionaire's tax. Both sides make their case. Plus, the NFL is changing concussion protocol again after Miami Dolphins quarterback Tua Tagovailoa is two serious hits to the head last week. But are they doing enough? Former Harvard football player, pro wrestler, and co-founder of BU's CTE Center, Chris Nowinski, joins me with a laundry list of the failures here. One side calls it the fair share amendment, the other the millionaire's tax or the tax hike amendment. And on your ballots next month, it'll be called question one. Whatever you call it, there's been a lot of disagreement on what kind of effect it would have on our state. But before we get into the debate, let's lay out the facts. A yes vote would, according to the Secretary of State's information for voters, quote, amend the state constitution to impose an additional 4% tax on that portion of incomes over $1 million to be used subject to appropriation by the state legislature on education and transportation. A no vote, of course, would keep things just as they are. Joined now by Dan Sensi for the coalition to stop the tax hike amendment. That's obviously a no. Steve Crawford for the fair share of Massachusetts campaign. It's obviously a yes. Dan, Steve, good to see you both. Thanks so Thank much you. for being Thank here. You. Thank you, Jim. Watch people vote yes. Because it'll make our tax system fairer and it'll provide more money for transportation and education. Right now, the wealthiest people in this state pay a smaller share in taxes than the rest of us. That's just not fair. To fix that, we need to amend the Constitution and, we, and, and it, by amending the Constitution, we protect that money specifically for transportation and education. Okay, so fairness, transportation, and education doesn't get much better than that, then, All does noble it? endeavors. So yeah, why or no? So. Well, uh, my counterpart here touched upon subject to appropriation as the point that you made there, is a very, very important one. What does that mean? It means that the legislature, as John Adams wrote it in our Constitution hundreds of years ago, is the only group that can appropriate funds. So therefore, this money, yes, when raised, will go to transportation and education. It will not raise any funding towards education and transportation. Why do you say it won't raise any? It doesn't have to, subject to appropriation. So when the legislature, which sees fit every year, and they're very good at doing so, at understanding what the needs are for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, they allocate funds to where they're supposed to be going relative to education. We're sixth in the nation in funding for education relative to transportation. President Biden now has billions of dollars coming down uh, in funding for transportation. So the legislature is going to spend where the greatest needs are. With this money coming in, it'll fund up to it'll fund up to where they appropriate, and then it'll be up to the discretion of the Would you support the question if there wasn't any discretion, as you say there is? We'll get his response. Would you support it? I didn't bring the question forward, Jim. I, I'm here to, to stop the, the language as it sees fit. How about that issue? I'm sure you've seen the Center for State Policy uh, a group at Tufts say that it is, <laughs> well, you made it uh, a face, but uh, uh, that saying that roughly 30 to 70 percent of the money that you uh, say mandate has to go to transportation and education are likely to go there. So it's not like it, nothing, like he says, but, but just a piece. Well, it, it, it's constitutionally protected. I mean, that we, we understand the role of the legislature, and we understand that that's why we put it in the Constitution, to make sure that that money is committed to those sources. What does subject to appropriation mean, then? That, that means that the legislature, um, within those areas, can say we need to focus on more money for higher ed, more money for early, early childhood uh, uh, care, more money to fix our broken bridges, more money to... You know, make sure that people aren't stuck in traffic as our economy starts to come back. But why can't they, let's assume it's, for argument's sake, $750 million for education. Why can't they say, I'm going to put his $750 million in education, and I'm going to take $750 million out that I currently spend on education and spend it on something else that may be good, but not on that. They're not, they're not precluded from doing that, are they? Right, but, you know, our campaign is, is being led for, by tens of thousands of teachers and other citizens mm -hmm. who are interested in this. We're not just going to go away. We're we're sure that that money is going to be additive, that there's going to be more money, and we're going to make sure that the legislature upholds their commitment that they made when they put this on the ballot. How about that? I mean, the Mass Teachers Association, a primary supporter here and others, have a lot of power. I used to be a lobbyist, and I use the term loosely, on Beacon Hill. <laughs> they have a lot of power up there. If tens of millions of dollars are spent between the two campaigns, the public knows what the issue is. It's not one of these arcane things on the ballot, and they vote yes. The legislature is going to have the goal to say we're going to disregard what the intent of the voters was? Well, we, intent we can discuss to that point. But let's also talk about what, why the union's doing this. 
to, to what advantage will they have? It's to raise their dues, to have more money come into the system towards that fund. They're, they're funding it. There has to be a return relative to that. The legislature understands very well the needs that are across it. We have a budget surplus of billions of dollars, Jim, right now. They're giving back $3 billion this year. Some would say if this were active today, this money would just have to come back. We don't need it. So what are they going to do? Where are they going to go? How are they going to raise any more funds to that end? And there are lots of, as you know, as a lobbyist or former one, there are lots of other advocacy groups who'd love to pull at that money. You know, they Health did care, divert cigarette health. tax money for economic development, like 15 or the, a ballot question, um, pardon me, a law earmarked money to cigarette related uh, diminution of smoking things. They diverted that money. To repeat myself, and I'm not trying yeah. to, to lecture. Feel free. This, this is a constitutional amendment. This isn't a ballot question. This isn't a regular law that Pete gets passed in the legislature. This goes into the Constitution. It is it is as protected as you can get. And I okay. can agree with him. Well, but, but it's not going to increase any funding. It's just a shell game. It's where well, the money know. goes. By the way, you don't you, it doesn't you say have it's to. not. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Does Do you agree that to. it doesn't have to? Correct. But there's a political process here that doesn't Understood. end when the legis when it gets this gets passed. Understood. Let's right? move to the tax thing. Make the case for whatever tax equity, tax fairness. Why, why is the tax policy part of this good policy, Steve? Because the, the the statistic I used before, people in the rich people in Massachusetts pay less than anybody else in taxes. That's part of the Constitution. We think it needs to be fixed. It will provide more money and make a more equitable society that improves that so that where your kid goes to school and the quality education that they get doesn't depend on the zip code. Can, can I ask a question? No, before you okay, do that, sure. I, want to, I just want to play. Well, you ask the question, then I'll play something. If we have a flat tax of 4%, the more money that you make, the more taxes that you pay. I don't understand the thing that could be more fair. Well, you that. know the vast well, majority well, of states have progressive income I understand tax, that. as does the yeah, federal yeah, government. No, that's a different question of fairness yeah. relative to that. Of 50 percent of the residents of Massachusetts don't pay income tax mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, well, they're not going to be affected by this either, right? No, understood. What yeah. was the point you're going to make? We have a flat tax of five percent. Yeah, five, the sorry, way, this bill, would, the way this bill would work is if you make more, if you if you make less than a million dollars a year, it's not going to cost you a penny more. If you make more than a million dollars. You're going to pay an extra 4% on your second million, and any million after that, good for you. But the millionaires I talk to, and I don't know many, they're like, okay, that's fair. I bet you do know many. I know too many. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to Carl, play Carl, their first Carl, ad. Carl, <laughs> I want to play the, uh, the first ad from the Vote No uh, Coalition for you. Here it is. Politicians are pushing a tax hike on the November ballot. That makes no sense. Our state already has the biggest budget surplus in history. But question one would nearly double the income tax rate. On tens of thousands of small business owners. Family farmers. And homeowners. Politicians aren't just taxing annual salaries. It would also tax the sale of small businesses and homes in Massachusetts. Vote no. Vote no. Vote no. Shirley Leung in the Globe wrote about this, and she—I hadn't heard the term before. One-time millionaires, you know, a business owner yeah, sells a business, uh, somebody sells their house, that kind of thing, and they're not regularly earning more than a million dollars a year. You can't laugh at me until I'm done no, the question. No, no, I'm laughing at their. At the and end. then uh, that one time, and you're apparently going to take away their whatever. So I, what do you say to that? I, I argued with Shirley before she wrote that column, mm -hmm. but you know, this is a common scare, ta scare tactic that lobbyists for the wealthy people in the state often use. They say if you make if you sell your house for a million dollars, you're going to pay your they suggest that you're going to pay this tax. Not true. If you're going to have to sell your house for a lot more than a million dollars to profit from the sale of that tax more what you said bought, bought the house for doesn't count. Any mortgage you have less doesn't count. If you're a married couple, you can write off $500,000 right off the top. 1%, actually less than 1%, 0.06% of the houses sold in 2021 sold, earned more than a million dollars, according to the Warren Group, the gold standard on real estate sales in Massachusetts. Isn't, I mean, in fact, you're smiling also, but it yeah. seems to me, I did a little independent research too, the number of people 
who would be affected as so-called one-time millionaires. There mm -hmm. are some. Yep. It's an infinitesimally small number. Is not it relative not? to those affected. 50%, 50 percent, 50.5. How actually. many are affected overall? Every year. How many affected overall? You said 50 percent. 50 percent of those affected. How many will be will affected? Will only be by, affected once. How many will be affected by the tax? The 50. You say 50 percent of what number? How many people? So are the 100 percent affected. Affected know, each year. How many is 100 percent? How many? What number? What number of people are affected by this tax? In housing sales? No, no, no. How? Overall, by the, uh, making over a million dollars a year, and as a result, have to pay a tax no, no, that, on that over. That changes every year. So roughly, yeah. roughly. You I, don't know? I don't, I don't, I don't want to ask you. Okay, continue. Jim, if we could throw a rock from where we're sitting right here, how many multi-million dollar homes would we, would we hit? And this is Brighton and Alston, Cambridge, right across the river. Housing prices that I look and I'm seeing are only going up, and it's not uncommon to have a home <laughs> be worth all that money. And... Over 90% of residents of Massachusetts, their greatest equity that they have, in, I'm sorry, their greatest asset that they have is the equity in their home. So when they go to retire, or they go to pass that on to their children, or they go to sell and downsize and, and have that be the nest egg that they have, they're going to pay 80% more taxes on the, the sale over a million that dollars. Is, that, that is not, that's just not true. I'll just use the, the metaphor that you use. You have to live in Dover or Martha's Vineyard for the majority of the houses to be worth a million dollars. The idea, there was just a, a story Steve, in the Boston how, how Business Journal. Let finish, so, finish, so, you can... just, there's just a story in the Boston Business Journal. I'm surprised you missed that. They list the names of mm -hmm. the towns. It is, it is not, any, and you have to earn a lot more than just a million dollars to get in on your, sell your house for a lot more than a million dollars to be impacted by this tax. And you know that. You have to, the people who are gonna be impacted by the tax are already making a million dollars a year. They're not, 50% of them, it's the only time it'll happen to them in their life. So is your point, point just so I understand, 70% 70 it the only no happens twice. Is the no uh, campaign's position that again, the federal government, which have a higher tax rate, the higher your income goes, yeah. the majority of states, that they're all on the wrong track, that having a flat rate, where as Steve said before, no matter how much you make, you pay the same percentage of your income, which obviously is a lot more painful to a low-income person sure. than it is to a wealthy person. That whole concept... Why is it more painful to a low-income person? Because they have a lot person. more disposable income, obviously, than a poor person does. But let me just ask you, okay. is the concept of progressive taxation uh, anathema to the no campaign? The people of Massachusetts, since 1962, have had that option five times, and they voted it down two to one, mm -hmm. five times. It's actually not true. The last time they voted it down, 71 to 29. I was leading <laughs> the <laughs> campaign. <laughs> Go ahead, what, 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 what Dan is arguing is that you know, their, their campaign is funded by five, most of their money comes from five billionaires in Massachusetts. And what he's saying, it, it is fair for them to pay the same amount as somebody who makes twenty-five or thirty-five thousand. Not same amount, same percentage. Same percentage. Same yeah. percentage. Who I, funds your campaign? Massachusetts Teachers Association, American Federation of Teachers. You know, and we've got you know hundreds of independent yeah. donors, including myself. You know, Dan. One of the things that I, I, I've read or heard in, from the opponents, uh, I, don't, I haven't heard from you, but yeah. other opponents, is if the tax rate is raised on those making a million dollars a year, some significant number of people are going to leave the state. I have to say, when I used to do tax stuff for a living, what most wealthy people, particularly in business, told me is the most important thing to them is that we have a highly educated workforce, that we have roads on which we can get goods to market. Uh, uh, and that seems to be, not seems to be, it is in the language, the focus of the question. So you don't think that will outweigh an extra $40,000 if someone makes $2 million a year? Yeah. Uh, the, the effect on uber wealthy is a red herring, Jim. That's, that's, what not, that what, that's not what this is about. This is about how it's going to affect small business owners. This is how it's going to affect farmers. This is how it's going to affect retirees and people. This is much more of a middle class tax hike than it is for the uber wealthy. The uber wealthy already probably domicile in New Hampshire and Florida anyway. They already know how to tax So who prepare. are we talking about? We're talking about middle class people. We're talking about people. This is only going to happen to them once <laughs> in their life. The person making more than a million dollars a year is a middle class person? Collective. In Massachusetts right now, that's where it's about to be. When you sell your house or you sell your small business or you sell your farm because you've had it in your I, family. I, I, How do you respond to that whole issue of movement? I mean, that is a concern well, to a it, lot it, of people it, who are objective on this people, issue. People stay here because they came here for school. They grew up here. Their families here. 
a friend of mine used to say that if, if the pilgrims had landed in California, Massachusetts would be a national park. This is a nice place to live. Mm. And, you know, and, and people, that's why people stay. These were, the threat that millionaires who are the, the least cost effective people, cost sensitive, a, a cost well, sensitive they're not I'm cost sorry. sensitive group are going to move because they have to pay an extra 4% on the portion of their mortgage, uh, of their income. Would you, don't don't you answer dollars. that differently now than you would have before the pandemic? I mean, a lot of people who've got a lot of money, a lot of people don't have a lot of money, work remotely. And that's even easier for somebody who's got a lot of dough. That doesn't concern you? And I don't think they moved. I don't think they moved out of state. Some people did. Some people, you know, some people moved to Vermont or New Hampshire for a little while. Friends of mine who did that. They didn't like the schools. They moved them back here. They moved their families back here. You know, before you go, one of the, the, the things you've emphasized this is this is not a law change. A law change, I right. assume people know at home, right. if you change the law, I experienced this myself, the legislature can right. amend it in any way to make it better or worse, right. whatever better works means. To amend, Once you've amended the Constitution, if you succeed, the only way it can be changed, obviously, is if you go through the whole process Correct. again, Correct. et cetera, which is a multi-year process. Right. Tell us why you think that's a good thing that this is in the Constitution. Because, well, first of all, it addresses the concern that people have about the legislature being to fiddle with the money. We get that, get that argument. But this, the 5% flat tax was established 100 years, 100 years ago by amending the Constitution. We think it's part, an important product, part of the process of being in a dem democracy, and we th think it's time to be updated. Well, obviously, I, I should have been clear. You obviously have to amend the Constitution right. at a higher right. rate. Right. I meant as a matter of public policy, you think it's good that it be locked in in that fashion. Yeah, and we yeah, think I mean, here's I, the change. I, I regret to use the term lockbox because of the person who used it famously before. That'd but, be almost <laughs> President Gore you're talking <laughs> exactly, about. That's right. right. Exactly right. How about, we won that race, but that's How about the other argument. The other side here, is, is, do you have a problem Forget the merits of the question for a second. Sure. The issue of the language being in the Constitution, and for better or worse, depending on one's point of view, obviously we don't, one would have to go through a multi-year process to change it. Is that a good or a bad thing? <coughs> I, I think it's a bad thing. Why is and, that? And I think that, that five different times the people of Massachusetts have agreed with me, and they voted it down two to one, that they thought it was a bad thing as well. But we're not establishing a, a graduated income tax. We're simply saying one thing. If you earn more than a million dollars, you're going to pay 5% more. That's the definition more. of a graduated income tax. No, it's not. It's a surtax, actually. No, That's uh, the definition. It's, but, it's, but listen, you know, I, I'll, we Jim, can talk Jim, about that afterwards. Last word. I, I'm all for fairness, and I'm all for people paying what is right and to move our state forward without question. This thing has had to manipulate itself to certain ways because it's taken so many years to get here. It was struck down by the Supreme Judicial Court because of its language once Different before. Different question. Yeah. Right, but it had to get to this point and taken it to where mm -hmm. it is. To the point now that the scope of it, of who it affects, and this grand scheme of when it affects them now, when we have the largest sur surplus in the history of Massachusetts with people coming out of COVID, with small businesses struggling, looking to recover, and with tens of billions of dollars coming from the federal government for education and transportation is not the right time for 15 it. seconds. We need a dedicated stream of revenue to fix our schools, fix our roads, and transit. That will do this. $2 billion a year can only be spent on these areas. You can't plan on emergency federal money and budget surpluses. Steve, thank, thank you so much for your thanks. thoughts. Dan as well. Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Love that. Next up, we've learned a lot about the devastating lifelong impacts that can come from the type of head injuries that are all too common on the football field. In response, the NFL put some safeguards in place, none of which, it seems, were followed when Miami Dolphins quarterback Tua Tagovailoa hit his head hard on the field during a game against the Buffalo Bills last Sunday. Tried to get up and shake it off, then fell back down. And yet somehow he returned later in the game with the Dolphins' leadership saying he passed the concussion evaluation during halftime. And then he played again Thursday, just four days later, and took a massive hit midway through the game that resulted in his being carted off the field on a stretcher. He was later diagnosed with a concussion, and unfortunately, that was a moment my next guest, Concussion Legacy Foundation co-founder and CEO Chris Nowinski, saw coming. He tweeted before the game this, if Tua takes the field tonight, it's a massive step back for concussion care in the NFL. If he has a second concussion that destroys his season or career, everyone involved will be sued and should lose their jobs, coaches included. And afterwards, Chris wrote, I take no pleasure in being right. Pray for Tua. 
We saw this coming. Chris Nowinski joins me now. He's also a former All-Ivy football player, pro wrestler, neuroscientist, and as I said, co-founder, well, I didn't say co-founder of BU's CTE Center. Chris, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Jim. So when you were watching the uh, game on Sunday and you saw the hit and you saw Tua's reaction, what was your first reaction? Yeah, my reaction was, oh, good. Everyone saw how obvious the, this concussion was, so he's going to be out. Like, it's unfortunate, but the, the protocol's here for, and we've all finally learned, and we won't see him the rest of the game. And when you heard that it was allegedly some back tweak or some such thing, how would you react to that? I was very angry, and probably for the first time, I implied a swear word on my Twitter response saying this is absurd. Uh, what are they doing? And uh, yeah, I felt very confident that this was a concussion you can diagnose from your couch. And luckily, the rest of the world appears to agree with me now. Okay, so four days later uh, is the Thursday night game, which unfortunately a lot of us saw because of the incredibly painful scene. I just read a tweet that you said everybody involved should lose their jobs. Who is culpable here, Chris Nowinski? Well, this one, I think there's four groups, right? First, there's the medical staff. And, and while they have fired the uh, unaffiliated neurotrauma consultant, it's not that person's call. It's actually the team doctor's call. So I'm very worried about the experience and skills of this team doctor. And I would expect that person won't be there at the end of the season. Uh, or we knew next season. Uh, the coach, the, the other message we're trying to get out there is we can recognize concussions now. Everyone in football knows they look like they've had them. So for the coaching staff not to step in and go, that eh, diagnosis doesn't seem right. Uh, this guy's the future of our franchise. We're going to have a great season. They should have stopped and pulled him out. And I've been happy to see a lot of coaches, you know, Rex Ryan, people on TV saying, yeah, you, you treat them like your son. You don't put them back. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the ownership or, or the leadership of the team was thinking. I'm sure they were watching the game. They all know that's a concussion. And the reason I predicted it before it happened is I wasn't going to really say anything. But then... Uh, the NFL was promoting the Thursday night game on their on their social media, saying, oh, it's it's Tua versus Joe, our two young, hot quarterbacks. And I'm like, all right, now they're a couple of books. I thought the NFL was at least smart enough to call the Dolphins and say, hey, uh, this would be a really bad look. That was clearly a concussion. Uh, but they didn't. They promoted it. And so it just sort of the veil is again lifted that this is not about the players and their health. The NFL is just out there trying to, you know, maximize their profit and reach Roger Goodell's goals and and you know, people are going to get hurt in the process unless we step up and fight back. You know, uh, speaking of the the coach, I, I uh, well, you heard it too. Something he said after Thursday's game, he could not be this stupid. Uh, uh, this is Mike, I'm serious. I mean, this is Mike McDaniel. Here's part of what he had to say after the second concussion, the Thursday night game. Here's McDaniel. The best news that we could get is that everything is checked out, um, that he didn't uh, have any anything more serious than um, a, a concussion. The best news is he didn't have anything more serious than a concussion? I've, I've softened a tad on my stance on that because I was very aggressive on that too. This guy doesn't get Why? it. Because Why'd you soften? If you, if you saw the mechanism of his fall, you know, if you saw him backboarded, you would think you're backboarded because you were worried he had a neck injury. So seeing him fall straight back, like there's almost zero chance he had a neck injury. But now I'm thinking about it, he was probably referring to the uh, decorticate posturing. So the fact that he looked like he a stroke victim yeah. when he clenched his hands together because his cortex was that temporarily damaged that it was like having a stroke. I'm guessing he was confused by that, um, not being a brain injury. But that's just a sign of a brain injury. So the worst possible outcome was always going to be a brain injury, and that's what he had. But maybe his lack of medical experience uh, influenced that decision. That's the kindest I've been to him all week because everything he's saying – makes no sense, and it's like he's never heard of concussions before. Not, you know, not just, uh, uh, you're kinder than I, I should say, but you know more than I do, too. Not only uh, what he said after the game, he's uh, bragging, maybe, the he's describing how they rode back on the plane together, him and Tua, yeah. and he's sitting next to Tua. Tua, they're talking, they're laughing, and then all of a sudden, Tua starts watching a movie on his phone. Even I know, thanks to you, by the way, and your colleagues, that no screen time is part of the protocol once you've had a concussion. And apparently he didn't know that or didn't give a damn about it. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if you knew that. Uh, you know, people's expectations for concussions are not always appropriate. So 
they don't, they always assume like if you had a concussion, you're going to be groggy and you're going to be sad and you're going to, you know, act, look like someone who's hurt. But those of us who've had them know that there are oftentimes where people are knocked unconscious for like a minute or two, they'll pop up and they swear they're fine, yeah. but they don't even know a concussion ever happened. And that might be the situation we have here that it too is either not fully aware of how bad he looked because he was, you know, when you have a midbrain yeah. injury, your memory may be impaired. So he didn't know what happened uh, or else he's trying to put on a good front because he's scared of death now of being labeled a concussion Understood. guy, which means he may not be re-signed or get the best maximize his contract because the team's going to blame him for getting concussions when actually it was the team and the league who put him in this bad spot. Chris, you've worked off and on with the NFL uh, uh, as a result of the brilliant research and work you and your colleagues have done. I, as a consumer, and I'm almost embarrassed that I am of the game, say they are not to be trusted at all. All they care about is getting the best players back on the field as fast as they possibly can and let their health be damned. Is that unfair? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, uh, in this situation, it's a reminder that the incentives are not aligned and the NFL prefers to have their stars in the field rather than uh, having proper concussion care. And that we've known that forever. We thought it was getting better. This is a reminder that it's not. And I, I always like to say, though, like I was already extremely angry with the NFL to start this season, not because necessarily of concussion care. I thought we had, we were better at that, but because of chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. So we're now live in a world where the NFL knows and has admitted their game causes this disease. And I would think, you know, they just moved the Pro Bowl to flag. And we know, we that. know that we need to convert youth tackle football to flag. Kids should not be playing tackle football before high school or any circumstances. But then I saw them roll out a commercial with Peyton and Eli Manning where they're recruiting little kids to tackle football again. And it's like, you know, when are they going to wake up and realize they do not want to be you know, playing the role of the Grim Reaper out there, recruiting our young children to football because it looks cool on TV, and then giving them a brain disease that they're going to, you know, just leave them in the dust when they get broken down. My entire day has actually been absorbed by all the families who are connecting the dots and found us and are asking for help with their husbands who have CT. The last one, I've literally been emailed us before this, 52-year-old ex-Canadian football league player whose wife is desperate because he's a mess. And that's what happens if you play too much football and we have to be honest about it. We only have a few seconds left. You showed me a beautiful photograph of your son and daughter, little son and daughter beforehand. Most parents watching the show, their kid's not going to be a pro football player. Would you let your kid, and is as lovely <laughs> as I said, would you, let your, would you let your son play football? Should the parents watching the show let their kid play football quickly? Yeah, uh, they're they're not, I mean, not not they're not playing any contact sports till they're 14. All right, we started a program called Stop Hitting Kids in the Head. No one's touching my kid's head till they're in high school, and then we'll talk again. From your lips to those parents' ears, Chris Nowinski, thanks to you and your colleagues for your fabulous work. Good to see you. Uh, thanks, Jim. That's it for tonight. Please come back tomorrow. Our ballot question series continues with question two, which would set a cap on how much of your money dental insurers can spend on administrative costs. Plus, the Natick couple harassed by eBay execs, the harassers' prison sentences, and what more consequences they want to see others who are involved suffer. That's tomorrow at 7. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget Ukraine.